Listen in on this week's Scientific American 60 Second Science Podcasts. I'm podcast editor Steve Mursky. In recent years, researchers have learned that trauma can be inherited, passed down due to changes in DNA, what's known as epigenetics. But researchers recently uncovered a new wrinkle to the story. The effects of trauma, which can be transmitted to the offspring, can be reversed by a positive experience. That's Isabel Mansou, professor of neuroepigenetics at the University of Zurich. She and colleagues studied newborn male mice and their mothers that were separated from each other, which caused them both to experience traumatic stress. Those male mice and their male offspring displayed trauma symptoms, which made them different from other mice that had not been separated from their mothers. But when these symptomatic mice were exposed to positive experiences, their behavior changed, as did the fate of their offspring. And we show that uh, the negative consequences of this, which are depressive behaviors, cognitive problems, antisocial behaviors, risk-taking, this can be reversed if, um, if the father, after being traumatized, was exposed to a positive environment. So this reverses the symptoms and it also reverses the, the biological reason, the biological cause for the symptoms in the progeny which are the epigenetic marks. Epigenetic marks can be corrected in sperm cells by this positive experience. The study was in the journal Neuropsychopharmacology. Mansu says the behavioral changes were associated with an increased level of the glutocorticoid receptor in the hippocampus, the part of the brain that contributes to stress responses. And these alterations were found in the hippocampus of the traumatized fathers and of their offspring. This is the first evidence that positive environmental surroundings can correct behavioral alterations that could otherwise be passed down, in this case via epigenetic regulation of the glutocorticoid receptor gene. Typically, drugs would be used to try to affect this kind of change. Mansu says this work could change that. There is hope that uh, even uh, people who have been traumatized during childhood and have severe symptoms, psychiatric symptoms, but it could also be metabolic symptoms or other problems with the body, that this can be reversed uh, at some point. So even if there is, it's engraved in the epigenome in a way, this is the system, the biology is dynamic enough to allow correction. Thanks for the minute. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Erica Barris. The tropics are well known for their biodiversity, but another hotspot is mountains, like the Hengduan Mountains in south central China. I mean, it will look very much like this kind of um, familiar temperate uh, alpine system, but um, the plant diversity there is off the charts. Rick Ree is associate curator of botany at the Field Museum in Chicago. These mountains harbor a third of all China's plant species, and one hypothesis for mountain biodiversity is that mountain uplift creates new climates and habitats. You'll see coniferous forests and limestone and granite outcrops with glaciers and glacier-fed rivers and alpine meadows. Plants take advantage of the new niches and diversify. Now Ri and his colleague, Yao Wu Xing, have evidence supporting this idea for a connection between mountain building and biodiversity. They use DNA data to build an evolutionary tree of plants in the Hangduan. Then they calibrated that tree with fossil data, and they saw an explosion in diversification around 8 million years ago, right when uplift occurred. The results are in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. So if new microclimates create new opportunities for diversification, what about global climate change? If we look back on the history of life, I mean, one very striking pattern that we can see is that evolutionary diversification is pretty strongly associated with changing conditions. The flip side to change is that some species go extinct and some species diversify. Um, And so we're faced with with both prospects, I think, going forward. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Christopher Intagliata. You're strolling down the street, or maybe hauling that load of laundry down a flight of stairs. When all of a sudden, your laces come undone. If you've ever pondered what precipitates this pedestrian wardrobe malfunction, you might want to tie your shoes and beat a path to the proceedings of the Royal Society A. In that journal, researchers have trotted out data that show that a combination of whipping and stomping forces is what causes laces to unravel without warning. The investigators noted that shoelace knots frequently fail when people are walking. 
but not when they're, say, sitting on the edge of a table and swinging their legs. Laces also stay tight when marching in place with no forward motion. That led the gumshoes to suspect that stepping and swinging somehow worked together to foil footwear security. But how? To untangle this knotty problem, the researchers made a slow-mo video of a student running on a treadmill, thus recording the literal steps that lead to catastrophic knot failure. Here's what they slowly saw. When the foot strikes the ground, the force of the impact causes the knot at the center of the lace to deform and stretch. And when the foot swings forward, the ends of the shoelace fly forward. That whipping motion pulls the knot open a bit more, which allows the free end of the lace to slip through a tiny bit. With each cycle of impact and whip, the free end slides a little more, until enough of it has come through that the knot finally unravels. The researchers confirmed that some knots are stronger than others. The granny knot that most of us use on our shoes is fairly weak and prone to failure, perhaps because the knot winds up twisted when pulled tight. A square knot, on the other hand, held up well in the treadmill test. To get that knot to buckle, the researchers had to attach weights to the free ends to aid in the tugging of those whipping tips. The researchers did not determine whether different types of laces are more likely to produce ties that bind. So, though this initial study has made great strides in our understanding of shoelace mechanics, we still have a long way to go before this research is all tied up. Thanks for the minute. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Karen Hopkin. Parkinson's is the second most common neurodegenerative disease. Neuroscientist Todd Scherer, CEO of the Michael J. Fox Foundation for Parkinson's Research. Fox, of course, is the actor who has become the public face of Parkinson's. And it is mostly its symptoms are characterized by motor symptoms. So patients or people who have Parkinson's will have a slowness of movement. They could have a tremor in their arms a lot of trouble walking, and they can also have rigidity, so it's hard to really bend and flex their muscles and and limbs. That's the predominant symptoms that people have. April 11th is World Parkinson's Day, so designated because it's the birthday of Dr. James Parkinson, who described the condition 200 years ago in 1817. I spoke to Scherer April 10th. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that has changed a lot about in Parkinson's disease and in the last decade, and I, I do think a lot of this has to is because of the work of Michael J. Fox, is really raising awareness about this disease. Um, Parkinson's disease is something that people live with. It's part of their life, but they are able to live with this and be productive and have make great contributions to the world and also the contributions that they can make towards the search for a cure. So I think by raising awareness, it can help people who have the disease today and their families deal with the disease, get the right information and the right treatments, and then also draw more attention on the need that we have for research and funds to support research and the direction that we're moving in that research. And how many people in America and or worldwide, what's a, what's a best guess estimate? The best guess is that there's about a million people in the United States with Parkinson's and probably about four to five million worldwide. The greatest risk factor for getting Parkinson's is being 60 years of age. So I think it's also important to shine a light on these age-related neurological diseases because we do have an aging population. And now is the time to really invest in the research to try to get out in front of that, that challenge and develop new treatments, particularly transformative therapies. The full conversation with Scherer will appear as a Science Talk podcast in the coming days, and look for an essay by Scherer on the Scientific American website scheduled for publication at noon on April 12th, as well as the April 10th article on the site titled Cell Therapy 2.0, Reprogramming the Brain's Own Cells for Parkinson's Treatment. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Steve Mursky.